For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dorothy Greco. I have been following after Jesus for 41 years now. I'm a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mother to three grown sons, and I'm also a writer and a photographer. So this morning I hope to achieve two things in this short talk. My first objective is to normalize the reality that from time to time all of us struggle to love well. And second, I want to put it on your radar that it's often in those specific places where we struggle that God will not only resource us, he comes through um, to love well, but he will also bring us deep healing so that we can love more fully. So Luke 10 is a very familiar passage, probably for all of us. However, it's rarely applied to marriage and parenting. So let me quickly read it. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, What does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told them, Do this, and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? This question is totally relevant for our conversation today. If proximity defines someone who is a neighbor, um, I think that we'd have to say our spouse is our most enduring neighbor, followed by our immediate family. And if our husband is our foremost neighbor, then we need to figure out what it looks like to consistently love him well so that we can fulfill God's commandment. So I want you to think about a circumstance that makes it difficult for you to love your husband, or if you're not married, someone else who is dear to you. And be concrete. Think about an actual experience that you have had or maybe continue to have on an ongoing basis. And I wanna give you just like 15 seconds to call something to mind. either jot it down or, or make a mental note of it. Now I want you to think about how you feel when you know that you're not loving the way that you want to love. Do you get defensive? Do you get angry? Do you feel shame? And also make a note of this. And you can share your answers later in small group if uh, that's a safe space for you. So I've been married to my husband Christopher for more than 30 years now and during our three decades together I've noticed two specific situations that make it difficult for me to love him the way that I want to love him and the way that I think that the Lord is calling me to love him. First is when I'm sleep deprived. Sleep issues have unfortunately plagued me for 27 years. During my first pregnancy with our oldest son, who will be 28 shortly, um, he was posterior, so the back of his head was pressing against my spine, and that made it almost impossible to sleep during the last trimester. The sleep issues have gotten much worse during the course of the past year. So what it often looks like for me is I will get to sleep fine, sleep for three hours, four if I'm lucky, then simply wake up. And when I wake up, it's not like my heart is racing, I'm not feeling anxious, I'm just fully awake. Then I'll be awake for three to four hours and um, if all goes well, and if my day is not you know, beginning at the, and, and the first thing, uh, I'm able to get back to sleep for maybe 90 minutes to two hours. So that's a whole year of consistently sleeping only five to six hours in two shifts, not even straight five to six hours. So there are days when I'm so exhausted that all I wanna do is make it through the day so that I can go back to bed, even though being in bed seems to be quite fitful and maybe even like torturous to me sometimes. And on these days, I have very little desire to meaningfully engage with Christopher. I have to really push myself even just to listen well to him and um, Perhaps it goes without saying, I'm mostly disinterested in being sexually intimate. And I'm sure if you sat down with Christopher and asked him, you know, what are the hardest days for you to love your wife? These would top the list. And there's been far too many of them in the past year. I'm really sorry to admit that. 
So being under-resourced, I think, is a universal impediment to loving well. Maybe insomnia isn't an issue for you, but perhaps what handicaps you is being stressed out, being worn out, being depressed, or, or overwhelmed by all that life is asking of you in this season. And when you're struggling to love well, we always want to take an inventory to make sure that it's not due to physical or mental health issues, and, and if it is, to address those whenever possible. So when my father was in the last few months of his life, um, I was his primary caregiver, even though he lived five hours away. So at least twice a month, I would drive down to New Jersey, cook for him, clean his house, take him to doctor's appointments, make sure that he was well resourced for the next few weeks. I would then drive home and have to immediately re-engage in normal life. And this is at the same season that my first book, the, the edits were due. Um, I could really only offer Christopher and our two youngest sons who were home at the time crumbs. That was all I had to give them. Probably all of us have gone through or will go through seasons where circumstances that are outside of our control, that are external, make it incredibly difficult for us to love our spouse or others well. And when this happens, we need to recognize it, we need to talk about it, and we need to choose to extend grace and mercy to each other again and again. In other situations, our spouse's limitations or profound temperamental differences can make loving a challenge. Historically, I have found it difficult to love Christopher well when he's struggling with shame. And he has been particularly vulnerable to shame um, because he was on the receiving end of childhood bullying for several years and he was also twice molested as a teenager. And these experiences were compounded by the fact that he had a shame-based family system. So rather than receiving comfort and advocacy within his family, his emotions and his emotional needs were often marginalized or dismissed. So early on in our marriage, he would occasionally get sucked into what he now refers to as a shame attack. Some event or um, interaction would trigger feelings of worthlessness or inadequacy. You know, maybe the worship set wouldn't go well on Sunday morning, or maybe he would be impatient and lash out at the boys. And when shame got a hold of him, he would withdraw, he would entertain lies about himself, and he would be utterly inconsolable. Seemingly, there was nothing that I could do for him that would help him to pull himself out of the pit. Not praying, not feeding him good food, not saying kind words. Um, and so as we reflect on this pattern that happened, maybe 20 years ago, he was in day three of um, one of these shame attacks. And frankly, I was feeling like, like enough already, get over it. There's no real reason for you to be withdrawn and to be so pouty. And thankfully I didn't share those feelings with him, but instead I did express those frustrations to the Lord in prayer. And God's response floored me. Perhaps you've, you've also had one of these or more of these experiences when you suddenly get a really good idea or an impulse that's so brilliant or so noble, you know it has to be an inspiration from God. So in this situation, I felt like that the Holy Spirit was prompting me to invite Christopher to be intimate that night. And my initial response, being the godly wife that I am, was no way. And that was not because I don't enjoy our intimate life. I have, and I always have, um, but because I knew that I couldn't fake anything. I would have to be totally present to Christopher and extend kind regard to him, and I didn't want to. I was irritated with him, and I felt totally justified in my irritation. However, throughout the day, I intermittently prayed, Lord, if this is of you, you are gonna have to change my heart and resource me because I cannot do this in and of myself. And by bedtime, I was willing. And Christopher was frankly shocked when I invited him to be intimate because he knew that he was being a pill. And during our time together, he broke down and wept. This has never happened before and it's never happened since. So by reaching across the divide and choosing to love him, even when he was, by my standards, unlovable, it dismantled his shame in a profound way. And he marks this as a turning point in his ability to push off from shame. So that night, my actions communicated, you are lovable even when you're being difficult. And isn't that what all of us long to believe, that no matter how ugly, how broken, how difficult, that we're still worthy of being loved. And in the context of marriage and parenting, these moments are crucial because they help us to bond to each other. And I think that life presents all of us, married and singles, to love extravagantly on a regular basis. And far too often, I think we miss the opportunity. 
So it's super important for us to remember that when our spouse or child or aging parent is being irritable or pouty or distant, we cannot control them, but we do get to decide how we're going to respond. And there's no neutral choice. We can judge them and withdraw, or we can move toward them with love and acceptance. And the latter is unequivocally more difficult. Practically speaking, here's what that looks like for me. First, I have to have enough self-awareness to see in real time I'm withholding love from Christopher. The clues are I'm closed off, I'm not making eye contact, I don't really wanna hug him or touch him, um, and conversations can tend to be a little bit clipped. It's like there's an invisible wall between us. So my withholding might be because he's been ignoring me or because he was sharp with me earlier in the day or because we had a fight last week and we've never really reconciled, meaning there can be valid reasons why we aren't available to our spouse or, or others that we care about. Regardless, it's important for us to recognize and to name our behavior. Oh, I'm doing that thing again. So when I'm judging Christopher and or withholding love, and those two things often happen simultaneously, I'll say something along the lines of, hey, I can tell I'm not really available to you today. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I think it would be good for us to spend some time talking about what's going on for me in the next day or two. So notice I'm not saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me, but because you did this, right? Because that tends to invalidate our apologies. Then, when I have more clarity about why I'm not loving well, I can initiate a conversation that will give me the opportunity to talk about what's going on. By simply acknowledging what's happening, we can sometimes turn towards each other or at least help our spouse to know, I'm aware of what's going on. You're not imagining something here. And then after voicing this, I begin to pray and petition to the Lord to help me to grow and then walk it out um, as best as I'm able. I think that this kind of honest self-reflection and transparency can be valuable with our kids too. So if we're having a bad day, having an age-appropriate conversation with our kids where we say something along the lines of, I'm not my best self today and it's not about you, allows them to avoid becoming codependent and feeling like our mood is their responsibility because we don't want that. We don't want our kids to have to carry that burden. Now, obviously, sometimes our irritability is directly linked to something our kids or our spouse have done or have not done, but that doesn't give us permission to stop loving them or to give them emotional consequences. Sometimes the irritations and the barriers that thwart our love dissipate after we've had a good night's sleep, harder for me, or a cup of coffee. If they persist or if they become insurmountable, even after you've tried to have honest conversations, please reach out for help. And if you're in a relationship or a marriage with someone who's abusive or neglectful, different rules apply. Adults need to be held accountable when they mistreat others. So please don't assume what I'm saying is that you just need to love better in these situations. It's much more complicated than that. And I think I just wanna add a little comment here. I think one of the most difficult circumstances for us to consistently love well is when our spouse is being indifferent. It's so much more complicated to have honest conversations and to make progress when one spouse is stuck in neutral or flat out refuses to engage. Now this might be because of depression or other mental health issues, but it could also be because your spouse is shut down and they don't know how to deal with their emotions or maybe they're being passive aggressive. This scenario necess necessitates a tremendous amount of grace, patience and resolve, probably counseling or therapy and perhaps some well set boundaries. Boundaries in marriage and parenting should never be made as a form of punishment, but rather as a way to respect our limitations while moving towards greater health. So setting boundaries does not give us permission to stop loving. Let me just say that again. Setting boundaries does not give us permission to stop loving. Moving on to point number two. Sometimes it's difficult for us to love our spouse because our spouse is triggering one or more of our historic wounds. And if we're not aware that this is happening, we can easily get stuck blaming them for what we're feeling. Curiously, God takes advantages of these circumstances to break in and offer us opportunities to grow if we let him. So I wanna share an example of how God used one of Christopher's limitations to bring me into a place of deeper healing. And rest assured, as with the other examples I've already shared, Christopher has totally given me permission to talk about this. Um, as you can imagine from our last name, Greco, his family is of Mediterranean descent. 
like many from that area, he has time optimism. He sees time as a metaphor. My family is from Northern Europe, and if you walk into a public square, you often see clocks on the exteriors of buildings. One of the most iconic landmarks in London is Big Ben, not some work of art. So Germans and Brits tend to obey the clock. Many, many of our early marital conflicts centered on Christopher's ability to manage his time. So we would talk about when he might come home for dinner, you know, trying to reach a compromise, and then he would arrive anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes after the designated hour. Now this was not an everyday occurrence, but it happened enough to become problematic. This was pre-cell phone, so texting wasn't an option, but it wasn't pre-telephone and it wasn't pre-email. So he certainly could have called or sent me an email to say, hey, I'm running late. He almost never did. When this came to a head, I was home with two young boys and uh, any of you who are home full time with kids or, or caregiving uh, aging adults know the days can get really long. And as the pattern continued, I would get increasingly angry with him. And you know how that works. We're not simply angry for what's happening in the moment, but it's months or years of previous infractions. And even though I would commit, like in my heart of hearts, I would commit, I'm not going to get mad today. I'm not going to say anything when he arrives home late. He would walk in the door and almost immediately I would be like, what? Why are you so late again? So I was frustrated with him, but I was also frustrated with myself because I felt like I couldn't let it go and move on. And that's really important for us to notice when those things happen. So he would always apologize, but then the behavior wouldn't change. So it was hard to take his apology seriously. And we had one fight about this that was so frustrating that I actually wondered if it had been a mistake to marry him. The next day we processed again, he communicated again that he was sorry that his limitations hurt me. But then he added something that initially really bugged me. He encouraged me to consider if my anger was out of proportion based on his offense. I mean, after all, he wasn't stopping at the bars on the way home. He simply struggled to stop working at a certain time and come home. His question irritated and troubled me. So I spent some time praying about it over the next few months. Why was I overreacting so much? On one level, I sort of sensed that perhaps he was onto something. And here's where God took me over the next few months. My dad was an alcoholic for about a decade from the time that I was about nine or 10 until I was in my uh, early 20s off of college. And I have vivid memories of my two sisters, one older, one younger, my mom and I sitting at the dinner table waiting for my father to come home because for some bizarre reason, we waited for him to come home to start dinner. And then when he walked through the back door, there was that moment where we would all try to discern which version of my father is coming through the door tonight. Was he gonna be the sober, kind, soft-spoken man that I had come to love, or was he gonna be drunk? And if the latter, then the goal would be to finish dinner as quickly as possibly, get to my room and close the door without incident. So what do you imagine was the most stressful, conflictual time of the day for me as a teenager? Dinner time. Now, as an adult, I was aware of this. I thought that I had worked through all of my anger, all of my hurt feelings toward my dad, but through this conflict with Christopher, God was revealing, this is still taking up some real estate in you. Christopher's behavior was touching on this historic pain. And once this became obvious, I talked with Christopher about it. I apologized for overreacting. And I wish I could say that he was never late again, but that's not true. However, this is really important. His limitation had less power over me after that. I didn't overreact as much and I didn't lash out at him. So when you feel thwarted or incapable of loving your spouse or your family members well, you can always assume that God wants to help you grow. This is not one of those scenarios where you need to fast and pray to try to determine God's will. Again, referring back to Luke 10, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So a question worth asking on a somewhat regular basis, what does it look like to love my spouse or my child or my aging parent well in this season? Because needs are not static, they change. Do you know what your spouse or child or parent needs of you in this particular season? And if not, ask them. And if you're married to someone who doesn't think to ask you, you can tell them. I have felt a tremendous need for empathy in this season. 
And I've not only told Christopher, but I've reminded him multiple times. And when he defaults to giving his opinion or offering advice, I will remind him kindly, I appreciate your advice, but what I really need is your empathy. So God can use our limited flawed selves to bring healing to our spouse, and he can use our limited flawed spouse to bring healing to us. And we should expect this kind of thing to happen again and again throughout the course of our marriages. It's what it means to be transformed. And though it's not always easy, it is a gift. For this kind of transformation to take place, we need to be honest and self-aware, humble, intentional, and stay connected to the source of love, which is God. So I want to go through these things quickly before finishing up. What I mean when I say honest and self-aware is that we hold an awareness of our limitations or the places where we struggle and we need to grow. We're not clueless about how it's hard to love us. So if we routinely get defensive and lash out, but are clueless about why we do so or that we do so, it's much harder for us to change. It's helpful for us to pray like King David prayed in the Psalms. Lord, search me and know me. Reveal any places where I'm blind regarding my sins or my areas of weakness. With regard to humility, had I gotten defensive when Christopher asked if I might be overreacting to his tardiness, I would have missed the healing that God had for me. So we need to give our spouse and significant others permission to point out those places where we need to mature or grow. We don't have to like this, but we do need to be open to it. I don't know whether it's attributable to the law of entropy or something else, but growth, positive change, improving our marriage, however you wanna to refer to it, won't happen by osmosis. There is actual resistance, both human and spiritual, to um, moving forward in growth. So we have to prioritize becoming more like Jesus and then work towards it. This takes intentionality and it takes vision throughout the whole of our lives. So you might want to spend some time talking about where do you want to end up as a married couple, as a parent, or as a friend? What's your goal for the future? Then begin to do whatever it takes to get there. Chart a course. If you, don't, if you feel like you don't know how to change, hire a spiritual director or a coach. Gather together a few friends or couples and read through a thoughtful book together. So I included questions at the end of each chapter in both of my books, Making Marriage Beautiful and Marriage in the Middle, so that it would make for a really easy small group experience. You know, 10 to 12 weeks you can go through this book. And being honest with friends, I think promotes growth and healing like nothing else. The only way that we can achieve the kind of love talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, which really is the litmus test for our love, is if we stay connected to God and prioritize growing until we take our final breath. John 15, five reads, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Notice it does not say we can do some things on our own, but rather we can do nothing on our own, let alone the most important thing, which is to love another human being for the entirety of our lives. So each one of us needs to figure out what does it look like for us to remain attached to God? For me, in this particular season, it's spending time in creation. I feel like I cannot get enough um, time outside in the sun, hiking, walking, kayaking, um, being next to the ocean. Now, I still practice all the spiritual disciplines, praying, reading scripture, but it's nature that's really helping me to stay connected to God and to feel joy. For you, maybe it's dancing, playing an instrument, listening to worship looks, to, to worship music. Whatever it looks like, stay connected to the Lord so that you will have what you need to love well. So in closing, God always has a bigger, better story for us. So when loving well feels like work or even feels impossible, partner with God to determine what's going on. Talk about it. Get the help that you need. And rest assured that God is not only with us, but wants to provide exactly what we need so that we can love him and love our family in his name. And in the process, he's going to heal our wounds and help us to bring God's kingdom into our marriages and into our families. And this is holy ground. Questions? You can email me. Um, and you can do that through my site, DorothyGreco.com. And when you're there, please subscribe to my monthly newsletter. So let me just say a quick prayer for us uh, before I close. Lord, would you give us all, every one of us listening, the capacity to hold on to you and to receive what we need so that we can love our spouse, our children, our parents, our friends really, really well. 
Give us the humility that we need to admit where we're broken and where we need help. Give us the courage to press in and help us to love each other extravagantly all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for listening.